begin. The reason why I decided to talk about famous queens and warriors for this lecture is because in the Renaissance, half of Europe's rulers were female. So this was the age of female rule during the Renaissance. Okay. The first Renaissance queen is Isabella of, of Castile. She was the daughter of John the Second and Isabella of Portugal. Now Isabella of Portugal is an important woman because it was said that the madness that we will learn about from her daughter, you, jo Isabella's daughter Joanna, it all originated from Isabella of Portugal. She was known to be mad. As an infant, her do father died and her half-brother Henry took the throne. Isabella and her brother Alfonso and her mother moved to Aravello and that is where Isabella of Portugal developed madness. That is where they call madness because when Isabella of Castile becomes queen, she hardly ever sees her mother and her mother always remained at Arevalo and it was said that she was mad or she suffered from manic depression. Either way, she was known as crazy. Okay. Isabella's education consisted of reading, writing, music, and religious instruction. She did not know Latin. That is one of her regrets because she, when she becomes queen and she's in charge of her daughter's instruction, she made sure that her daughters knew Latin because she didn't. Her brother Henry, he was very unpopular with the Spanish nobles and they wanted, the Spanish nobles wanted her younger brother Alfonso, who was around 12 at the time, to be king instead of Henry and it launched a Spanish Civil War until Alfonso died of plague. With Alfonso gone, Isabella was next to be Queen, so they wanted Al Isabella to take her brother's place. But Isabella decided rather than continuing on the Spanish Civil War, she decided to end the war and made her brother Henry agree to be her successor. Now, this is important because Henry already has a daughter named Joan. So he had to choose his daughter over his sister Isabella. So he had to choose Joan over his, he had to choose Isabella over his own daughter Joan. Henry did not allow Isabella to make her own choice in choosing a husband. So Isabella decided to take matters into her own hands. She secretly married Ferdinand of Aragon and he had a, he, Aragon is a kingdom right next to Castile and he actually had to travel in disguise and not be seen because in order to marry Isabella. So it was very secret. No one knew about this until it happened because he could easily have been sent back to Aragon and the marriage could d d take place. And they married on October 19, 1469. Rumors say that Isabella fell in love with him when she looked out the window and saw him. That really wasn't true. Uh, there was no hint of Isabella ever having the opportunity of seeing Ferdinand through a window. But they did have a very, a relationship of equality and not, they had a relationship of equality and mutual respect. And historians are trying to decide who had the most power was it Isabella or Ferdinand? But it really was both. 
So the marriage between Ferdinand and Joan made Henry mad and he decided to make Joan his daughter, success, his successor instead. And it's really, we don't really know if Joan is really his daughter. He acknowledged her, but the reason why a lot of people went to Isabella instead is because it was said that Henry's wife, Joan, had an affair with one of her um, courtiers and Joan was illegitimate and that lessened her legitimacy to the throne. In 1474, King Henry died and this created another war between the succession. So the Spanish Civil War started again. However, Isabella had the support of the nobles. She was quickly invested as queen and her rival Joan was put into a convent where she remained for the rest of her life. And she lived a very long life. In what year did uh, Isabella marry uh, Ferdinand of Ar Aragon? 1469. So this was five years later she became queen. Yeah, she was 18. Okay. And Isabella and Ferdinand, their goal was to have a Christian Spain. And with the help of Torquemada, does anyone know who he is? The famous Spanish Inquisitioner? Yeah, um, the Spanish Inquisitor. He, well, she helped launch the Spanish Inquisition, which means she had to force the Jews to convert or leave. And some of them were burned at the stake. From 1482 to 1499 they launched a war with the Moorish Kingdom of Granada. They won and again the Muslims were forced to convert or flee. In 1492 she sponsored Christopher Columbus expedition who believed that he would reach India by sailing west. He founded the Americas. The expedition wasn't what they hoped but it became the start for their source of power because from then on they got gold from the Americas. And Isabella urged the Native Americans to be converted to Christianity. Isabella then died on... Well, they wished to or not. Yeah. It was either they were forced to. Isabella died on November 26, 1504. So she is a very controversial character because she forced many people to convert to Christianity and many Spaniards really when discussing Isabella they want to skip over her because she's a they remember her for these deeds of what forced Christianity. What happens to me to get it? Convert? Flee? They were forced to leave Spain. Oh. <laughs> but some of them, they went and tortured and were burned at the stake, like the Spanish Inquisition. There were about hundreds of Jews were burnt. But um, here's an interesting fact about Isabella that's not on here. Um, U.S. actually had Isabella on as their coin. They used her as a, they put her on their, their coin in 1893 to commemorate Christopher Columbus' expedition to the Americas. So she d has a place in American history because she was once on the U.S. coin in 1893. Okay, this is Isabella and Ferdinand's daughter, Joan the Mad. Joanna the Mad. There's a good movie about her called Mad Love that portrays her madness. And um, historians are wondering if she is a victim, a political victim, or was she really crazy? Now we will get down to her madness in a bit.
Okay. And see if she was really mad. She was the third child of Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon. Isabella and Ferdinand, they like to increase their prestige by having their daughters marry into prestigious marriages into other royal families. For instance, the first child, she was married into Portugal. And Juana, at infancy, she was betrothed to Philip the Handsome, who was the son of the Holy Roman Emperor. So when he, so when the Holy Roman Emperor died, he would become the next Holy Roman Emperor. So she had a very prestigious reputation. She would have been the next Holy Roman Empress. So this is where, you know, she's not mad because with this task to be the Holy Roman Empress, you don't, her mom probably didn't think she was mad, but up to the task. And she was known to be the most intelligent and the brightest of Isabella's children because she had five children. And her education consisted of grammar, history, French, Latin, mathematics, philosophy, religion, reading, and writing. So this woman who is supposedly mad, I don't think Isabella would have sent her mad daughter to Austria to Flanders to marry the heir to the Holy Roman throne, do you? All right. So at the age of 16, Joanna married Philip the Handsome. The two fell in love at first sight. So this is where we get into the insanity story. They got married immediately so that they could consummate their marriage right then and there. Joanna became obsessed with Philip. She um, even attacked one of Philip's ladies if, she, if Philip showed an interest in them because Philip was a womanizer. And she never wanted to leave Philip's side. One time Queen Isabella tried to separate Joanna and Philip, but that didn't work because Joanna got mad and through a tantrum and so she had to let her go and Joanna with the death of her brother and her older sister Isabella she became the heir to the Castilian throne so she is the next queen of Castile. Queen Isabella was worried about Philip's hold over Joanna because he was power hungry and she feared that he would manipulate Joanna once she became queen. In order to put a stop to this obsession to make sure that Philip didn't get the throne, Queen Isabella appointed her husband Ferdinand as regent of Castile. Philip and Ferdinand fought for the regency until Philip died of typhoid fever. Though some historians believe that Ferdinand poisoned him. Joanna became sole ruler. Now this is where everyone believed that she was crazy. Okay. Her first act as sole ruler of Castile was that she had Philip's body embalmed in Burgos. And she decided that his resting place should be in Granada. Joanna made a long funeral procession from Burgos to Granada, which was about 415 miles. Now imagine a whole funeral going out of Spain, going throughout Spain. And she even opened up the casket and kissed his dead lips. Okay, gross. So, yeah. She may have been, we don't know if she was mad, I mean, she may have developed, um, historians believe that she may have developed um, manic depression after the death of her brother, her sister, her mother, and 
Philip that she just didn't know how to react. And um, one tried to say that she wasn't insane because by going to Burgo San Granada and opening up the casket and kissing his lips showed that you know her the Spanish royal family lineage like because remember how um, Isabel and Ferdinand conquered Granada well that was a place where of uh, their victory and triumph so she may have wanted him to lay there to show to continue the legacy of Isabel and Ferdinand however Philip's funeral procession caused many people to doubt her insanity her sanity and her father quickly resumed regency and assumed to total power from then on he imprisoned her in Tortoisillas in 1509 where she spent the rest of her life and Charles took over as ruler when Ferdinand died and kept his mother locked up so she was in prison for the rest of her life by her father and mother and people think that she may have been a political pawn because her two her husband her father and her son wanted the power themselves and she was a woman and they didn't want a woman having power so that's why they said that she may not have been saying that she may have been a political pawn okay so that's the story of Joanna the Mad and she's really a big character in Spain she's a legend in Spain and they try to keep her story hidden. They don't want this known. But she's a very important person in Spain because from then on Charles and Philip are descended from her thus creating the Habsburg family. Alright, Catherine of Aragon. She's the youngest daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella. At infancy she was betrothed to Arthur who was supposed to be the king of the future king of England for he was the eldest child of Henry the seventh of England and Elizabeth of York and Henry the seventh and Elizabeth of York they there was once a Spanish as an English Civil War and Henry the seventh conquered and ended the war between England be and married Elizabeth of York so it was a very fragile dynasty and Catherine had the same education as Joanna so the Tudor dynasty was just founded and so they were very happy that a Spanish a powerful princess from a good family was going to be marrying into England however the only thing that she did not learn was English. Now you would think having been betrothed since infancy to author she would learn English but she didn't. <laughs> At age 16 she married Arthur. Six months after their marriage Arthur died of sweating sickness leaving Catherine a widow and Catherine spent the next eight years in England almost forgotten and living in poverty. Her father and her father-in-law abandoned her they didn't provide her any support and she had to pawn off some of her jewels when Henry the eighth became king he married Catherine the two shared a coronation together Catherine gave birth to a male in 1511 but he died soon after when Henry decided to go to war with France he named Catherine as his regent King James the fourth of Scotland decided to attack England in his absence and Catherine organized a battle. England defeated the Scots at the Battle of Flodden and killed James IV. And Catherine was very happy at the victory, but she was disappointed that she didn't get to send James IV's body to Henry. Now, this shows that she was just like her mother, Isabella, because she had that warrior blood streak in her, because she grew up with the War of Granada. 
As queen, Catherine commissioned p many paintings and sculptures. She even patronized Yuan Louis Vives, who wrote The Education of Christian Women. When Catherine could no longer bear children, leaving only a daughter, Henry decided to annul his marriage to her and marry Anne Boleyn. He believed his marriage was unlawful because he had married his brother's widow. Remember in Leviticus, that's where he based it on. He asked the Pope to annul his marriage. Catherine refused to go along with the annulment and she asked her nephew Charles V for help. Charles V kidnapped the Pope and from then the marriage reached a stalemate. So the divorce did not make any progress. All right, so did you know that King Henry VIII was the first king to be put on trial? And that was for his divorce. That was very unusual for a king to be on trial with divorce and even his queen to be on a public trial. And um, this is a speech she made I am read, that I'm going to read that she made at the trial, the trial that she attended. Sir, I beseech you, for all the love that hath been between us, and for the love of God, let me have justice. Take of me some pity and compassion, for I am a poor woman and a stranger born out of your dominion. Because she's from Spain, she feels alienated. I have here no assured friends and much less impartial counsel. At last, sir, wherein have I offended you, or what occasion of displeasure have I deserved? I have been to you a true, humble, and obedient wife, ever comfortable to your will and pleasure, that never said or did anything to the contrary thereof, being always well pleased and well contented with all things, wherein you had any delight or dalliance, whether it were in little or much. So she's saying that she's ignored his adulteries and just passed a blind eye. She's saying that she is a good wife. I had never grudged in word or countenance or showed a visage or a spark of discontent. I loved all those whom ye loved only for your sake, whether I had cause or no, and whether they were my friends or enemies. This twenty years or more I have been your true wife, and by me ye have di had diverse children, although it hath pleased God to call them out of this world, which hath been no default in me. So she's saying that even though most of their children died, she still, they still had plenty of children. And when ye had me at first, I take God to be my judge. I was a true maid without touch of man, and whether it be true or no, I put it to your conscience. If there be any just cause by the law that ye can allege against me, either of dishonesty or any impediment to banish and put me from you, I am well content to depart to my shame and other impediment and other dishonor, and if there be none, then here, I most lowly beseech you, let me remain in my former estate and receive justice at your hands. The king, your father, and my father, Ferdinand, king of Spain, thought then the marriage between you and me good and lawful. Therefore it is a wonder to hear what new inventions are now invented against me that never intended by honesty. I humbly require you in way of charity and for the love of God who is just judge to spare me the extremity of this new court until I may be advised what way and order my friends in Spain will advise me to take. And if ye will not extend me so much impartial favor, your pleasure then be fulfilled, and to God I commit my cause. And all this she was kneeling and pleading in front of the court. So, the, after she said this speech, she never appeared again. She got up and left. She was so angry and hurt. And imagine your whole sex life for all of Europe to talk about whether or not you and author had sex. I mean, that m was humiliating for, I mean, everyone in Europe was talking about it.
I mean, that was very humiliating to Catherine. Okay, so Henry did not make any progress on the divorce and he abandoned her. He broke away from the church and became the new Church of England and married Anne Boleyn. And Catherine, she lived the rest of her life in poor conditions and damp castles. She was not even allowed to see her daughter Mary. And she died on January 7th, 1536. And historians are now coming out saying that Catherine may have been poisoned because during her autopsy there was a blackness in her um, liver that doesn't seem cancerous so she may have been poisoned. <laughs> Anne Boleyn was the daughter of a noble family. Her father was the ambassador to Henry VIII so he was well loved by Henry VIII. She spent her childhood as a lady-in-waiting to Margaret of Austria, who was Catherine of Aragon's sister-in-law in the Netherlands. And as I said, she met Catherine's sister-in-law and Catherine's nephew. So she met her enemies very early because they were later on cause Anne Boleyn a headache. <laughs> In 1514, she became a lady-in-waiting to Henry's sister, Mary Tudor, when she became Queen of England for only a few months. And then, Queen Claude, when Mary Tudor returned to France. She may even have met Leonardo da Vinci because they were both at the French court at the same time. It was in France that she formed Protestant leaning, so she began to form Protestant ideas because the ladies, they read, as I said, there's the printing press, well, they read a lot of material and they discussed, they had seminars where they discussed their, the, where they discussed theology, so that is where she got Protestant leanings. In 1522, she returned to England to marry her, her cousin, James Butler. The marriage fell through because it was no longer advantageous for James Butler. He was from Ireland and they really didn't want her to go to Ireland. And she decided to serve under Catherine of Aragon. She then had an ill-fated romance with Henry Percy the son of an earl, so she could have been a countess. <laughs> However, the romance was broken up by her parents and his parents because they didn't think it was advantageous for either of them. And Anne was forced to leave court. Anne had many admirers, including the famous poet Thomas Wyatt. He even wrote a poem about her when she died. <laughs> However, she attracted King Henry VIII's attention. King Henry decided to annul his marriage to Catherine and marry Anne Boleyn. <laughs> it took seven years for Henry to marry Anne Boleyn. So seven years of waiting and she really, it was very stressful for her because she probably didn't think she would be queen and she was hated by the people, the people were throwing rocks at her, one even, there was once a mob where, where she was going on a procession that tried to kill her. She wasn't very light and as I said earlier, Elizabeth Barton was saying that Henry VIII will be dead within a month if she, he married Anne Boleyn. So it was very stressful for Anne. He finally married her in 1533. And this was because Anne was already pregnant with their child. In June 1533, Anne Boleyn was crowned Queen of England. In September, much to Anne and Henry's disappointment, the child was a girl. And we all know who that girl was, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Anne, this is her time as queen. Anne supported the first Bible published in English and rescued Protestant reformers. She made clothes for the poor. So she 
supported the first Bible published in English and helped distribute it. After a series of miscarriages, Henry VIII decided to get rid of her so he could marry Jane Seymour. They really... Many historians believe that um, this was a coup, a political coup from Catherine of Aragon supporters, you know, because two weeks before she was arrested and sentenced for execution, Henry VIII pleaded to the Pope asking for the Pope to recognize him and Anne Boleyn's marriage and we don't know why they did it and they believe that they framed her that, that M. Catherine of Aragon's supporters framed her so they because she was too powerful because she was threatening many of their supporters and because she was too powerful they wanted to get rid of her but so we don't know if it really was a political coup or Henry VIII was tired of her because why would he ask the Pope for them to recognize the legitimacy of their marriage if he was going to arrest her for treason and adultery. Okay. On May 2nd, 1536, she was accused of adultery with five men, including incest with her own brother. This was not true. They really just wanted to get rid of her because Catherine of Aragon was a pain for Henry for the divorce. And they, it was easier to get rid of Anne because she didn't have an uh, emperor at her back. There was a mock trial where her father, uncle, and ex-fiance were forced to declare her guilty. Now imagine her own father calling her guilty. I mean, that must have been painful for Anne. Anne was beheaded on May 19th and 10 days after her execution, Henry VIII married Jane Seymour, who gave him the son he wanted. Okay, Mary the First. She was the daughter of Catherine of Aragon and Henry the Eighth. She was named Princess of Wales and spent her childhood to be preparing to be Queen of England and she had a Catholic upbringing. She was proclaimed illegitimate when her father married Anne Boleyn. It, however, in 1544, Henry the Eighth restored her right to succession after Edward VI. Edward VI became king in 1547 and he didn't, he wasn't weary against his sister Mary because Edward VI was a Protestant and while Mary was a Catholic so you could see the religious wars. Mary even held masses in the chapel which displeased Edward. When Edward died, he tried to make it to where Mary wasn't queen and tried to install Lady Jane Grey as his successor. However, Mary had the support of the English nobles and deposed, Amble, deposed Lady Jane Grey and she beheaded her. And Mary became the first queen of England, so she's the first queen of England to rule in her own right. She was 37 years old when she became queen, so she was middle age. Mary's goal was to restore England to the Catholic faith. This was a difficult task because her father and her brother already made it a Protestant nation. In 1554, she decided to marry Philip of Spain, who is a Catholic. And Philip is her cousin because both Philip and is a, and Mary had the same ancestors, Isabella and Ferdinand. So she was Isabella and Ferdinand's granddaughter. This caused a sin among the Protestants who feared 
the Spanish influence on the on England so there were many rebellions that Mary had to squash in 1555 Mary made a law allowing the burning of Protestants so she burnt Protestants and around 300 Protestants were burnt at the stake that's why she is known as Bloody Mary okay not only was she Queen of England she was also Queen of Spain so she was Queen of Spain too because Philip became king so she had a double crown throughout her reign Mary tried to reform England's currency and expand international trade she also entered war with France and she lost England's remaining French territory Calais so that was the end of French territory in France of English territory in France Mary died in 1558 most likely from cancer Elizabeth I was the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn after her mother's execution she was declared illegitimate she had a fine education she was fluent in many languages including French Italian Greek and Latin and she was well versed in diplomacy and had a thorough knowledge in Protestant theology so she was a biblical scholar in 1544 Henry VIII restored her right to succession after Edward and Mary even though both Mary and Elizabeth were still considered illegitimate <laughs> when Mary decided to marry Philip her husband <coughs> wanted to marry Philip who will be her husband Protestant rebels wanted to make Elizabeth Queen instead in order to put a stop to the conspiracies Mary imprisoned Elizabeth in the Tower of London the same Tower of London where her mother was beheaded okay so she was imprisoned in the Tower of London Elizabeth became Queen on November 17 1558 at the age of 25 so at 25 she became Queen and because she had a 46 year reign and is known as one of England's greatest rulers I'm only going to highlight the accomplishments because there's a lot going on I could have a whole series on Elizabeth um, Elizabeth returned to England to Protestantism however she decided to have a middle ground to please the Catholics she made the Church of England continue many of the Catholic traditions so while they were Protestant they still had many Catholic traditions Elizabeth she oversaw a reign of peace and prosperity her reign was often referred to as the Golden Age and was known as the Great Age of Exploration because she encouraged a lot of exploration throughout England she encouraged open trade she sponsored many expeditions one of whom is Sir Francis Drake he became the first Englishman to navigate the globe she even unsuccessfully tried to have the first English colony established which was Roanoke so you know about the Roanoke the mystery of the lost colony well that was her idea and it was her settlement and as you know it wasn't successful but it was the first colony in America and that's what she did she was able to clear the nation's debt in 1574 and under her reign many famous writers of her era included Ben Johnson Christopher Marlowe and William Shakespeare in 1588 Philip II launched the Spanish Armada because Philip II didn't like Elizabeth her, his former sister-in-law to have a Protestant country and he was a Catholic and he wanted to conquer England and so Elizabeth you know had to be at the Battle of Tilsbury to prepare for the Spanish Armada and so 
130 ships of, were going to invade England. And this is what she said at the Battle of Tillsbury while the Spanish were on their way. This is the famous speech. My loving people, we have been persuaded by some that are careful of our safety to take heed how we commit ourselves to armed multitudes for fear of treachery. But I assure you, I do not desire to live to distrust my faithful and loving people. Let tyrants fear, I have always so behaved myself that under God I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and goodwill of my subjects. And therefore I am come amongst you, as you see at this time, not for the recreation or in this sport, but being resolved in the midst and heat of the battle, to live and die amongst you all, to lay down for my God and for my kingdom and my people, my honor and blood even in the dust, I know I had the body but of a weak and feeble woman, but I had the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England too. And think foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm, to which rather than any dishonor shall grow by me. I myself will take up arms, I myself will be your general, judge, and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. I know already for your foreignness you have deserved rewards and crowns, and we do assure you in the word of a prince they shall be duly paid you. In the meantime, my lieutenant general shall be in my stead than whom never prince commanded a more noble or worthy subject, not doubting but by your obedience to my general, by your conquered in the camp, and your valor in the field, we shall shortly have a famous victory over those enemies of my God, of my kingdom, and of my people. She never did take a battle and they didn't have to go to war because you know why? Luck came down on them because the Spanish didn't reach England because of a storm. They were very unlucky because due to a storm the entire fleet was wiped out. Talk about very unlucky for the Spaniards and fate, <laughs> but they were very unlucky. <laughs> That was really a lucky chance because the Spanish were power, more powerful than England at the time. And for them to be killed by a storm, a natural disaster, they were saved. And however, it made England look good because they defeated Spain by a storm. <laughs> she died in 1603 and she was succeeded by James VI of Scotland, who is Mary Queen of Scots's son. <laughs> All right, Catherine de' Medici. She's a powerful French ruler. She was the niece of Clement VII. At the age of 14, she married the Duke of Orleans and the second son of King Francis. However, a year later, her husband had a lifelong mistress, Diane de Portiers, who was 20 years his senior. So she was pretty old. He had an old mistress. <laughs> in 1547, Catherine became Queen of France. However, Catherine comes into play when Henry II dies in 1559 in a jousting accident. He, they hit his, the jousting hit his eye, the lance hit his eye, and he got blind and died from it. All right. And she became regent. She tried to reconcile with the Huguenots, which are French Protestants. However, a civil war broke out in 1562. This became the start of the French Wars of Religion. To end the civil war, Catherine married her daughter Marguerite to the Protestant King Henry of Navarre. However, she had a plan up her sleeve because during the wedding celebrations, Catherine instigated St. Bartholomew's Massacre where where hundreds of Huguenots and their leader Coligny died during the wedding celebration. So at night, they all stuck in and had a battle. I mean, they had killed. At night, while everyone's drunk and sleeping, 
they snuck in and killed the Protestants. So it, she became a bloody queen. Like Game of Thrones. Yeah, like Game of Thrones. Because, I mean, it's a wedding. I mean, who would expect a massacre at a wedding? <laughs> Catherine died on January 5th, 1589, and her reign still consisted of many wars with the Huguenots. And she is Mary, Queen of Scots' mother in law. And if you see the TV show Rain, that's the woman. <laughs> Okay, Mary Queen of Scots, who is, as you know, going to be made into a movie. <laughs> she was the daughter of Marie de Guise and James V. She became Queen of Scotland when she was only six days old. So, at six days old, she was Queen of England. And do you know why? Her father, James V, didn't learn from his father he decided to invade England and got himself killed. Those Scots are stubborn and they never learn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so that is why she's queen. <laughs> All right. And soon she will too die at the hands of an English woman, <laughs> Elizabeth. <laughs> All right. And her life is so dramatic it can be a movie. Well, it will be. All right. In 1548, Mary was sent to France to marry the Dauphin Francis in order to secure an alliance against England. So they wanted to secure an alliance against England. So she wanted, because England was their enemy and they were Catholic. Protestant at the time, so she wanted to strengthen France, her alliance with France to fight England, and to, from there, really, she believed she was the rightful heir to England throne because Elizabeth was illegitimate, considered illegitimate, <laughs> and she was the niece of Henry VIII. Okay. She became Queen of France in 1559. However, in 1560, King Francis died, and in 1561, Mary decided to go back to Scotland to rule on her own. Mary was a Catholic, but when she came back to Scotland, she found her country changed because they were all Protestants. So, in order to reconcile with the Protestants, Mary decided to marry her cousin Henry Stuart, who was given the title of Lord Donnelly. Imagine going back to your country and finding it changed. <laughs> Their marriage was passionate at first, but Donnelly was uh, power hungry and an alcoholic, and Mary refused to let him share power. The relationship soured when he and a few of his friends murdered Mary's favorite secretary. David Riccio, an Italian. So he married, so her husband murdered her favorite secretary. But payback will come later. In 1556, Mary gave birth to James VI and had him baptized in the Catholic faith. This caused an outrage among the Protestants. And this is where Mary's downfall began. Okay, now, Elizabeth is an example of a successful ruler. Mary is an example of a ruler, a failure. So, yeah, historians even said a study in failure. There is a book about it. <laughs> All right, so, the, so you should learn not to rule, how not to rule through Mary. All right, in 1567, Lord Donnelly was assassinated in Edinburgh when the house he was staying blown up. So he was murdered. This event became known as the Gunpowder Plot. Many people and historians believe that the perpetrator was Mary's eventual husband, James Hepburn, the Earl of Bothwell. 
And they also speculate that Mary was involved in her husband's murder. So after the gunpowder plot, Mary did a stupid thing and married her husband's supposed killer, the Earl of Bothwell. This caused an outrage among the Scottish nobles and they disapproved of her marriage and they imprisoned her in Leven Castle and they forced her to abdicate the Scottish crown. Mary eventually escaped and she gathered a small army to take back the Scottish throne but she was defeated and she fled to England which is a stupid mistake. I mean she I had two choices France or England. France where her mother-in-law and lived and where, you know, because her mother was a French woman and she had family there, or England where her cousin really didn't want her and who Mary claimed that she was the true ruler over the Elizabeth who she, Mary believed was not. I mean, isn't that another fatal mistake? Very dumb. I mean, sorry. Because she could have gone to France, but she chose England. <laughs> Once she arrived in England, she was immediately captured and arrested. Queen Elizabeth imprisoned her at various castles for 19 years. So she was in prison for 19 years. In 1586, she did another stupid decision. She they found evidence of her plotting to kill Elizabeth. Letters written in code where she wrote about how she planned on killing her own cousin. <laughs> okay. This was found out by Elizabeth and she was executed at Fotheringhay Castle on February 8th, 1587. So. Katerina Sephorza. This woman is not a queen, but she was a warrior woman. And her biggest enemy was Cesare Borgia, who we know, all know Machiavelli respected in The Prince. <laughs> Caterina was the illegitimate daughter of the Duke of Milan. At the age of 10, she was betrothed to the Pope's nephew, Girolamo Riario, and married him at the age of 14. She gave him eight children. In 1481, she was given the title of Countess of Forley. When Pope Sixtus died in 1484, there was turmoil in Rome over who should be the successor. One of Caterina's homes was destroyed in the turmoil. Caterina was so upset about what was happening in Rome and wanted to oversee the choice of who would be the next Pope herself. So in order to do this, she seized control of the Vatican's fort, castle of St. Angelo, and refused to stay there. So she seized control of the castle. She was only 21 at the years old at the time, and she was seven years pregnant when she seven took months. over. Yeah, seven months pregnant when she took over the throne. I mean, when she took over the fortress. In order to get Katerina to leave the fortress, the cardinals tried to bribe her husband by giving him 8,000 ducats and a military post. While her husband agreed, because he really wanted the money and the post, Katerina refused. <laughs> instead, she increased soldiers, so she got more soldiers instead. And this caused an ache among the cardinals. Katerina resisted until the cardinals agreed that she should supervise their actions. Thirteen days later, Katerina surrendered the castle and gave it back to the cardinals. So until the cardinals agree that she can supervise their actions of who the next pope is, she finally left. <laughs> but that ain't all that she's done. After her surrender, Caterina and Girolamo moved to Romagna. He was not a popular ru ruler, and there were uprisings which Caterina suppressed. In 1488, the Orsi brothers assassinated her husband. C 
Katerina, her mother and her half-sisters and her children were taken hostage. The conspirators tried to force Katerina to surrender Forley, her city, which she refused. She even refused when they even put a knife to their children, to her children, and threatened that she, they would kill her. She refused. And you know what she did? She lifted up her skirts and said, "Go ahead and kill them because I can produce more." All right. And this is the account that Machiavelli set road of this legendary fortress. <laughs> All right. Some Forley conspirators killed Count Girolamo, their lord, and took his wife and his children, who were small. Since it appeared to them that they could not live secure if they did not become masters of the fortress and the Castilian was not willing to give, the, give it to them, Madonna Caterina, so the countess was called, promised the conspirators that if they let her enter, it would, that if they let her enter it, she would deliver it to them and they might keep her children with them as hostages. Under this faith, they let her enter it. As soon as she was inside, she reproved them from the walls for the death of her husband and threatened them with every kind of revenge. And to show that she did not care for her children whom they were threatening, she showed them her genital parts, saying that she still had the mode uh, for making more of them. Okay, now, this may seem heartless, Okay, why would Katerina open her skirts when they had the knife to her children and say, oh, that's okay, go ahead and kill them. I can make more. You know why? She was not heartless because she knew the Orsi brothers would not touch her children. Because the Orsi brothers, Katerina had at her back Milan, her and she relied on Milan, the Duke of Milan, because it was her family, to conquer them. And the Orsi brothers were afraid to touch the children, to kill them, actually kill them, because the Duke of Milan was at her back. So she knew she was, they, they weren't going to harm her children. And eventually, her uncle came to her aid Katerina and her uncle wiped out the conspirator, so she was not a heartless mom. <laughs> she just pretended to be. <laughs> Katerina married Giacomo Feo, but he was assassinated in 1495. Katerina executed his assassins. Throughout her reign for, of Forli and Amola, Katerina had to defend the bat her her city against the battles between Milan and Naples who were warring at the time and her cities were stuck in between. Machiavelli was very impressed with her and her defense attacks and he praised her in the prince so he was she said that he she was one of the greatest warrior women. And this is what a, Contemporary accounts say of Katerina. Wise, brave, tall, fine, complexioned, well made, speaking little, she wore a dress of satin with a train of two arms length, a black velvet hat in the French fashion, a man's belt and a purse full of gold ducats, a curved falcon at her side, and among the foot soldiers and the horsemen, she was much feared because she had a weapon in her hand because she was much feared because when she had a weapon in her hand she was fierce and cruel. However, in 1499 this is Katerina's downfall. Katerina was blamed for trying to poison Pope Alexander VI which wasn't likely of course. It was a way to get rid of her because she was causing trouble among the Borgias. Cesare Borgia waged a war against her. Both cities fell to Cesare. However, Caterina still kept on fighting. 
She wore armor and defended her castle Ravadino until it fell in 1500. She was imprisoned at the Vatican for four months. Caterina then retired to Florence and pursued an active interest in alchemy and she died in 1509. So that's the story of the greatest war woman in the Renaissance. Well, that's all I have for today. Next, the d week after Thanksgiving will be Women Writers of the Renaissance.